And this is my co-moderator, Dr. Harry Keeling, who is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science here at Howard University. So we hope that this panel, which will cover applications that are currently in use and on the horizon, will provide a sense of the variety of uses to which these digital tools can be put and highlight that no single application is truly representative of their use. Um, I just want to mention that anyone in the audience would like to uh, ask questions of panelists, uh, write your questions on the note cards that are being passed out and will be uh, collected later on. With that, I'd like to introduce the distinguished members of this panel. Um, so we have John Rao, who is an executive vice president and general counsel of Adobe. Next, we will have Henry Tout, who is the Division Director for the Division of Information Intelligence Systems in the Directorate for Computer and Information Science and Engineering at the National Science Foundation. Then we will have Angela Granger, who is Vice President of Analytics at Experian. And then Melissa Sherritt McSherry, who is Senior Vice President, Global Head of Data Products at Visa. We have uh, Michael Abramoff, who is the Founder and CEO of IDX and Professor of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Iowa and also Professor of Engineering and Computer, of Electrical and Computer Engineering and Biomedical Engineering. And then we will have Teresa Zayas Caban, who is the Chief Scientist at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. So uh, with that, Dana, would you like to yeah. begin your presentation? Thank you. Um, thanks for being here. So um, first thing I wanted to just sort of get out there, I'm a lawyer, and people are like, why are you talking about AI? And I thought I'd throw that out there because there's some very distinguished um, computer scientists on this panel. Um, so I was actually an electrical engineer undergrad and uh, Villanova University. And so when I was at law school, I was going to write a paper, um, a note for the journal. And uh, this book was on my dad's desk, um, Understanding Neural Networks. This is back in 1996. So I thought, oh, that'd be fun to read. And I read it. And I wrote my, my paper, which got published, called Neural Networks, Here, There, and Everywhere, which was a wildly inaccurate characterization of where neural networks were in 1996. Um, so don't come to me for your stock uh, advice. But it was, it's been a fascinating topic for me. And, and at Adobe, um, we're really interested in this topic, and, um, and for us, AI is, is, is special because we have this entire business that's focused on helping people be creative, and creativity is a, is a part of the brain that doesn't follow rules. It's unstructured, and traditional software programming is a very structured form of, of algorithms. It's predictive. You understand the rules. You understand how to characterize it. And that's actually not a great fit for creatives who tend to break rules. And so our products have always struggled to bridge that gap between innovation and creativity and the structured um, form of traditional computer programming. And AI bridges that gap. And it really allows us to create tools that are better for our creative customers. So when we think about um, what we, how we look at AI um, and digital creativity, we're really focused on minimizing the mundane eliminating those repetitive tasks that everybody has in their day. Um, and so for creative professionals, there's a lot of complexity in the tools and in setting up the camera shots or the video shots that are not actually the highest value add that they have, the, where, where they're really trying to get their artistic sense across or fulfill the goal of a marketing campaign as they create content for it. Um, the complexity of, the, of, of adjusting each pixel's luminance or, or, or the color or the background of the lighting um, gets in the way of them actually, actually doing the part of the work that, we're paying, that they're getting paid to do. So that's what we're really interested in using AI is to eliminate those, those mundane tasks. We also, um, Adobe, at Adobe, we've, we've noticed there's a huge demand for content now. Uh, and that's either because of social media channels and people are posting content all the time on Instagram and Snapchat and, and Facebook, um, or on ad campaigns, digital media advertisement campaigns, where digital marketing campaigns where you are um, personalizing content for each consumer. So there's a huge demand for content, more than ever before, and our creative professionals need to be able to create content at a higher velocity, and that's what AI is helping us do. 
So when we think about AI, we think about it in the creativity space in two buckets, content understanding, computational creativity. And Adobe also has an experience intelligence business. I'm not gonna talk about that much today, but just for transparency, we also have this other business that also uses AI in a different way. Content understanding is really trying to get behind what's in an image, for example, or a video. So it's easy to look at an image of a cat and say there's a cat or there's a house and just do sort of basic object recognition. Um, what AI allows you to do is provide that insight into the image and that abstract layer, a conceptual layer above what you typically can do pre-AI. So we can understand things like actions and concepts and styles and sentiments. So just abstract concepts that are in your image that, that the AI can infer um, from the, looking at it. So we have a couple of um, demos that we're gonna show. We're hopeful they're all gonna work correctly. I think this is going, yeah, it's going. Um, and these, this uh, deck will be published on the Adobe Public Policy blog, so anyone who wants to see the full deck and watch the videos through can do that. But um, we're just going to talk through a few couple seconds of these. So this is a person in the, um, in the, let me just go back here. So set this up. So this is a, a person using our stock photography service. And so they want to start a creation. And so they want to be able to say, I have an ad campaign for Nike how should I start? And they go to our stock photography site and they just search for things to sort of as an inspiration for the ad campaign. And so for example, in this example, this person is gonna say, I, you know, I, I see this image of this woman with a ribbon jumping, that sort of captures the aesthetic of what I want. And there we go. There we go. Um, and so she, they, they choose this picture and then what Adobe Stock does, it recommends other pictures that are very similar to this picture. So in this case, she says, okay, I like this, this is a good start for me. Um, and then Adobe Stock at the top does sort of normal picture recommendation. Here are other pictures of people with ribbons and that may be what you're looking for. But in this case, that's not what we want. Like Nike actually wants this sort of freeing freedom. And so we select the woman jumping and our AI understands that what we want is actually the action of jump. Like that's what we want out of this picture. Not the color, not the ribbon, not the blue sky. We want the action of jump. And so now we actually recommend pictures that are about jumping. So we can take the concept of that picture and using AI understand, okay, they actually wanted jumping. And so now we can just show these other pictures. Now the next level is we say, okay, well Nike didn't really want a picture of random people jumping. It was actually supposed to be a family picture. So we take family and we use the jump concept from the first image, so you see how they're stacked on the right, and now you have families jumping. And now the creative professional could say, that's where I want to start. I want to choose one of those pictures and start my campaign from there. So how do we do it? So what we do is we, our AI will analyze these, these um, the, in this case an image, and look for the concepts behind it. So you can see um, on the, in the middle there's concepts, and on the right, there are percentages. The percentages are the confidence that our AI is actually accurately predicting what is going on in there. But what you can see is we've analyzed those faces, and we've analyzed the context of the picture, and you can see that we've said, oh, there's happiness there. There's love there. There's joy there. We've understood the abstract concept of those pictures. And so you can go, if you're a creative professional, and say, I need pictures of my, my theme is love. You can type in love as a search term. And you're going to get a wide variety of images, but they're going to have this concept in them. You can also look for families, right? And it'll understand that the connection of these three people plus the expression on their face means that they're a family. And you can understand, and you can search for concepts like family as part of this. Um, and so you can, you can see all the different kinds of categories that you're able to search on using our Adobe uh, AI technology to analyze what is actually going on inside the picture. We also have a um, PDF, an Acrobat service you know, and that has lots of text. And we've actually run our AI on the text to understand the intelligence behind the, um, the words. And we have married that up to images to allow you to do automatic phrasing. And again, we can do very basic captioning. So you put your photo there, and we can say couple on a bike, and that's object recognition. But then we use AI, and there's a little slider you can see that's moving. And you can say, I'm gonna, I want to see what the AI thinks this is. And it says, young couple on a bike. Or in this case, it's a beautiful peacock, right? So you, it understands you know, not just the image, 
but also the concepts behind the image. So if you wanted to search for beautiful, you'd get that peacock, for example. Um, so this, these are the techniques that are being used when we talk about content understanding, the first part of how we look at AI and creativity. You know, it's traditional machine learning, it's traditional deep learning, and we look at all these things like aesthetics and style and color um, as part of the, we train our AI to understand these concepts, and then we are able to provide these services to our creative professional. The second piece of what we do is try to make the creative professional's day faster, and that's what we call computational creativity. And that is trying to help their workflow. How do we help them do those tasks even faster than they used to have to do under traditional software? So here's an example. Let's say um, somebody wants, uh, Macy's wants a, an ad campaign, and they told you to go out and shoot uh, a cityscape at night, and you go out and you spend six months getting this shot at the right lighting, the right building, the right angle, and you're like, all right, I'm great, I'm happy. And then you turn it in, and Macy's like, you know what, we've changed our mind, we want a different setting, we want it to be the sunset. And so then, traditionally, you'd have to go spend another six months reshooting this picture, trying to get the lighting correct. So with our AI, we, we can automatically segment out the, the part of the picture that's of interest to you, and, and, and that's the, the cityscape, and then we let you import another picture that is of the desired lighting and sky that you want. And with one click, you can now take that lighting and put it in your picture. So that's probably not 100% of what the creative professional wants for their Macy's campaign, but it's probably 80% or 90% of what they want. And now they can take this picture and make it into exactly what they want with very little extra effort. So you've just taken six months of extra work, of not exciting work. That was not the fun part of their day. The fun part of the day was setting up that shot to get that image in the first place. And now they can take this and they can go back to Macy's. And if they come back and Macy says, you know what, we've changed your mind, snowy, blue sky day, five minutes later, you can just change. And so um, the AI really helps um, drive that routine out of your day. Another example is uh, what we call neural stylization. And so again, this is the idea that we've been able to understand the style of an image. And so we've trained our AI to understand the style of different famous paintings. And so if you have your photograph on the left and you said, I want it to look something like the interpretation of these two different paintings, you can do it. All it does is understand the style of whatever painting you put in and there's just a style of it. So it's not just copying the colors rotely like you might have expected pre-AI. It understands what the style of the image was and applies it to the image. So just understanding that concept of, I think this is gonna play. And, and so this is not just um, for creative professionals, this is for hobbyists. You can take your own pictures and you can upload whatever artist you want and it's gonna take the style of the artist and apply it to your picture. And it understands that concept. We can also do this, use AI, and we do use AI for our video editing products. So this is a project called Project Cloak, and this is a normal example where you have, you've shot a scene and, and, and in post-production, you wanna get rid of something you don't like. In this case, you don't want those, um, you don't want that couple there. So using AI, we, we can segment the image and understand who's in the image and what they, who they are, and we can also fill in the background with copied pixels to make the background look perfect. So on the left is the original footage, and on the right is post AI, and it looks like they're just vanished, right? And then that used to take months of work to do, to edit two people walking out of a pic video, and now you can do it in minutes. So as I mentioned, we also have an experience intelligence business. This is the other side of, uh, of our business. This is the digital marketing business that allows you to target advertisements, and, uh, and allows chief marketing officers to understand what their, the content in their campaign is doing. So we provide that service, and we use the AI there as well. We use it to help you predict the results of a campaign before you even launch it. You may, we may say, this is going to be successful in the Northeast, or this is going to be successful in California based on our, and our analysis of, of customer data who've been interacting with their website. That's a, a, another way we're using AI at Adobe. So I think the question is how we get there. How do, you, how, do you, how do you actually produce the AI? And I know there's gonna be a lot of people talking about the, the nuts and bolts of the computer science, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. So this is how Adobe does it. We are an AI product is called Sensei, um, and this is the architecture. And so what we do is, what we do typical with any, any neural network, we have the, have the neural network, and then we train it with data. And we train it for an outcome. And using this, Using this architecture, 
um, we're able to create the, the neural network, we freeze it in place, and we ship it in Photoshop, we ship it in Premiere, and that's the, um, the result you see as a consumer. So the principles, is, uh, my second to last slide, <laughs> the key principles for, for training AI that is important to Adobe, and just a, a takeaway for everyone, is how do we make the how do we make this product work as well, is we need millions of pieces of data to train it. You need lots of examples of artists, you need lots of examples of images in order to train the neural network to understand the insights that we're able to show you. So when you think about how do we make AI beneficial, how do we get the rewards of AI, you need access to data. You need access to a lot of data and you need access to a variety of data and that variety of data will make your neural network accurate and the variety of data will also eliminate bias. You can imagine bias when you're looking for images that is inherent because you may have trained your, your AI on a particular kind of, uh, of a person. And if you go searching for a job or an occupation, you're always gonna get that person because that's what you trained it with. So uh, the wider variety of data you put into the AI, the more likely it is your results are going to be unbiased. So thank you for your time. Um, this is, this is our presentation, Creativity in AI. Um, with AI is, is, is what Adobe is focused on, is how we believe um, AI will help transform the creative professionals um, for today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you. for that colorful and creative presentation. Uh, so next, uh, Henry Copes will begin his presentation. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to focus my uh, talk on the work we've been doing at NSF to support AI applications for social good. So when we look at a proposal, we have two major criteria. First, we want to advance uh, science or engineering, looking at, at fundamental ad advances. But we also consider potential for broader positive impacts on society. Now, the traditional broader impacts that were frequently uh, mentioned in proposals were training graduate students and potential future applications of the results. So someone say, I'm doing this fundamental research, and maybe someone in the future will come along and do something to benefit society with us. But increasingly, we see that the, the fundamental science and these broader in Packs are entwined, that as you work on a application for social good, you discover new questions that require fundamental scientific advances. And from those advances, you discover that there are new opportunities. So AI and, and, and broader impacts. Uh, so AI methods uh, taken broadly that includes machine learning, knowledge representation and reasoning, and what we uh, might call deliberative intelligence, making uh, optimal decisions, are being used uh, by researchers in every discipline. Uh, that's funded by NSF. I'm from the computer science, and my particular division funds a lot of the fundamental work in AI but there's really no area of NSF now, including the social sciences, where you don't see people talking about AI. And increasingly, we're partnering with other agencies that are funding or taking advantage of work in these fields. So we've seen a, uh, over uh, the last uh, decade, we've grown up a quite a rich portfolio uh, of what we call cross-cutting programs. So these are interdisciplinary funding opportunities that involve multiple directorates within NSF and sometimes with other agencies. Some of the most important are the Smart and Connected Health Program that we run with NIH. And so there we're looking at AI research that is a bit more applied than traditional work funded by NSF, but is not yet ready for the kinds of actual clinical uses that NIH would fund. So we both put money in there 
and then we help bridge the gap between those agencies. Smart and Connected Communities looks at applications of AI to all kinds of problems facing urban life, from uh, pollution, uh, uh, policing and violence, um, transportation, other issues. We've had a uh, program for several years now called Big Data in uh, Science and Engineering. And that is to support broad collaborations or collaborations that can cover uh, a number of fields. You might have material scientists together with a computer scientist uh, or you know, electrical engineer together with a computer scientist or even uh, medical people. Um, and through that big data program, we've also funded what are called big data hubs. So the idea that these are a set of universities that act as resources to um, all of the universities in that region for uh, activities such as helping making connections to, to uh, government agencies. And uh, through that, we've had programs like the Civic Innovation uh, uh, Challenge. One of our most recent programs that is particularly relevant for broader impacts is one called the Future of Work at the Human Technology Frontier. And it's a very interesting combination of directorates, computer science, engineering, education, and then our social, behavioral, and economic uh, sciences. So we're now looking at the future of the workplace, and in particular, how AI will be impacting that future. So we want to fund both uh, the, the kind of technology we might see in the future. So for example, in a recent, uh, our, this is, we just completed the first year of the program, and one of the awards uh, was on smart classrooms. So how we might integrate AI as a teacher's assistant and not replacing a teacher, but assisting a teacher. Uh, but we also will be uh, looking for work where technologists work with social scientists to look at both the positive and the negative consequences. Will AI throw uh, millions of people out of work? That's, that's absolutely an, an open question. Um, if you look back at the, the, the history of, of science and technology, you can make quite good arguments uh, either way, that AI will lead to uh, permanent unemployment or that AI will lead to new um, uh, opportunities for employment. Uh, and this is, a, a, this is another example of the uh, work from this most recent uh, program. Um, solicitation, so whole body exoskeletons for advanced vocational enhancement. So here we're looking uh, you know, at something a little bit different than your traditional uh, uh, robotics for manufacturing, but augmenting uh, the human uh, worker to, to give the human worker superhuman uh, strength and endurance. Or, as I mentioned, in, in classroom teaching, uh, where we, a system that is monitoring a classroom and noticing when students, uh, uh, those students who have become apparently disengaged are not uh, working, are not attending, and uh, uh, can uh, perform such tasks as uh, simply alerting uh, the, the teacher or engaging in a personalized activity with the student. So one of our very largest grant programs is called Expeditions in Computing, and these are, are typically uh, $10 million uh, over uh, uh, four to five years. So here we're really looking for, for research of the highest intellectual merit. All of our reviewing is, is, is a system called peer reviewing, where we get unbiased uh, scientific experts from uh, the, the community to, to review. And in expeditions, we have multiple layers of, of reviewing because we really want to get the best of the best. And in addition, these pro these, the work we fund should um, address the nation's 
NATO's greatest needs. So to give a, a, just a, a, a case study of the synergy between positive, broader impacts and scientific merit, I'd like to just mention some of the work going on at our, the Institute for Computational Sustainability, which is a, uh, uh, the result of actually two successful expeditions in computing that went to a consortium of Cornell, Stanford, and University of uh, Southern California. So the problem here is looking at sustainability problems, and by sustainability we're looking at uh, environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, uh, resources, social sustainability, very broadly, as complex uh, problems that are really too difficult to solve uh, with human intelligence alone. So we want to employ um, uh, AI techniques and large amounts of data to solve uh, optimization, pro essentially uh, resource optimization problems that are far beyond the kinds of linear optimization that most of the people in this audience would be familiar with. These are highly nonlinear problems where we must model uncertainty uh, so we can't, uh, we just can't ignore the fact uh, that, uh, that many, there are many um, uh, variables that are unobserved. Okay, um, now you might think that, well, these are all different problems, but what has been so fascinating uh, by this uh, expeditions is that problems that seem to be quite different often have very, uh, have shared technical solutions, okay? So this is a, a subway map that the research group um, uh, created and as we see, each of the tracks of the subway, the six tracks, whoops, the six tracks are uh, scientific uh, uh, themes. So pattern decomposition, uh, crowdsourcing, uh, uh, mechanism design, so social choice theory and economics, uh, spatial temporal modeling, uh, probabilistic inference, and sequential decision making. And then each of those tracks is going uh, through the stops, where the stops are the particular applications. So, and in each application, you had domain experts. So let's say there's one there on um, uh, landscape scale conservation and rural communities. So that included, you know, uh, people who knew a lot about that topic and uh, had been studying and working uh, with communities in Ecuador, uh, but it made uh, use there of a temporal uh, modeling, probabilistic uh, inference, and sequential decision making. So you see uh, so quite the variety here of uh, flight call detection, and I'll we'll mention that again, wind and solar uh, forecasting, um, uh, all the way over to microbial fuel cells. Now, now one thing I, I should point out is uh, AI covers many things. There's, there's sometimes a, a, a tendency because of the great success of what are called artificial neural networks to uh, say that that is AI. And as we, we just saw from the previous speaker, um, artificial neural networks are wonderful when you're dealing with patterns, doing pattern recognition, uh, uh, and essentially trying to um, emulate those parts of intelligence that don't involve essentially logical thinking, but are more based on uh, pattern recognition and intuition, um, uh, the kinds of problems we don't think about when we solve them, recognizing your friend's face, right? You don't think consciously about it. By and large, uh, the work in, in this particular um, uh, set of projects, though, involves what we might call uh, your, your, your type two intelligence, your deliberative rational intelligence, where you have many alternatives to consider. In fact, there are such a large number of alternatives, you can't simply enumerate them all one after the other. You have to have very clever ways of, of essentially uh, uh, searching through a, a, a 
an enormous, sometimes infinite space of possibilities and narrowing in on those points that are near optimal. Okay, so just going down a little bit deeper, um, the, the, the problem of, of data, uh, of decomposition in big data. So this is um, so a, a, a core technical problem. You have some kind of very complex uh, signal and you want to um, reduce it to something simpler, right? Uh, to to uh, a small, to one measurement or a small number of measurements. Um, so this is also called dimensionality redu reduction, um, uh, source separation, uh, sometimes called segmentation, uh, but it makes use of a body of algorithms that have been come up in, in computer science, electrical engineering, and particularly more and more in uh, work in AI. So we had a, there were a series of, of projects, um, one on detecting gunshots, and you can imagine security applications in a city, another on detecting elephant calls. So you can put out uh, audio monitors in the jungle and use that to conduct census, uh, census of elephants, right, based on their calls. That same work was then used uh, to detect um, uh, uh, bird uh, calls uh, of actually birds in flight uh, for a project with the uh, School of Orn Ornithology at Cornell. And perhaps uh, surprisingly is with very few changes uh, that same algorithm uh, was used in a, uh, a project on, on crystal phase mapping um, which is in uh, material discovery, so a problem where you're coming up with a, a mix of new materials, you hope they have some, some property, and you're, you're analyzing the results of shooting x-rays at those new materials. Um, another example, uh, my, my last example here, is dealing with um, hydropower in the Amazon basin. So there are um, uh, a great potential for getting more uh, hydropower from the Amazon basin. And in fact, 170 dams have already been built or under construction, and about 300 dams are planned or proposed. Now there's obviously a big problem here. If all of these dams are built, not only will there be uh, quite a lot of devastation to uh, wildlife, uh, but they will become less effective because one dam is going to um, affect the water flow to a, uh, another dam. So you have to look at this as a, a multi-objective optimization problem to balance off uh, energy, uh, fisheries, um, uh, uh, transportation and navigation. Obviously, as you put in more dams, you're going to make river transportation much more expensive. And finally, looking at the long-term effects, how will all these dams affect the, uh, the natural flow of, of sediments and, and nutrients that, and how will that affect farming? So this becomes a multi-objective um, optimization problem. And then the goal is to look at the trade-offs between these different factors and have an algorithm that can present, well, here is the possible um, uh, uh, best trade-offs. There's no single best trade-off, but you can look at uh, that any solutions that don't fall along this line are provably worse. They're, so they're worse in some respect and uh, no better in any other respect. So this tremendously reduces this sort of infinite uh, space of the number of dams and the placement of dams uh, to one that is now can be um, decided by humans. Yeah, so it's showing whether the dams. Um, and interesting uh, the, that this, is, this, this same um, effort has led to uh, startups, for example, Atlas AI, um, that is a, a basically a, a profit, a, a for-profit um, uh, AI for social good company. There's also received funding from the Rockefeller Foundation uh, looking at uh, providing, helping developing nations be more sustainable in their agricultural uh, practices. 
uh, uh, networks of uh, CompSus net, a, uh, a larger network that in, includes um, this, this group of these three universities with others to address these kinds of problems. And with that, I'll uh, conclude. Thank you. Sorry, it's a little tight up here, so we thought that would be the better route to get around. <laughs> um, I lead analytics for Experian, and one of those um, areas that I'm responsible for is credit scoring, product development. And for those of you that don't know, Experian's a global leader in consumer and business credit reporting and marketing services. We, supply, we support excuse me, clients in um, over 80 countries, and we have approximately 17,000 people in 37 different countries. We believe it's our responsibility to assist lenders in managing consumer credit risk and empowering consumers to understand and responsibly use credit in their financial lives. We're committed to being the Consumer's Credit Bureau, and I thank you guys for having me here today. There we go. Um, to set the context for today, there's a lot of different areas of application for credit scoring, so we're gonna, I'm going to uh, specifically talk to scores used to assess eligibility for credit where adverse action may, may be taken. Um, the example was used a couple times earlier today, specifically of application for credit as an example where you could be approved or declined um, your application for credit. That would be the credit scoring context we're talking about today. Benefits of AI or machine learning um, for both lenders and consumers in our industry are ultimately um, better lending decisions. If you have greater insights into the data that you're using, better accuracy in the scores, you're going to have better decisions being made. Um, and secondarily, financial inclusion. Where we're really finding the power of AI and machine learning techniques is our ability to evaluate new data sources more quickly and in incorporate that new data into uh, credit scores, thus broadening the access for credit for people who maybe have thin credit or are new to credit and don't have a, a credit file with us today. Where we like to start is with the data. Um, if you think about predictive modeling um, and any kind of modeling for that matter, it's important to understand the data that's feeding into the model. Um, for us, we talk about traditional credit data. And when you think about traditional credit data, what we refer to is what you typically find on the core credit databases at the major credit reporting agencies. And this includes um, information around what we call trade lines or account level information where you get access to a consumer's payment history on a certain type of account, their outstanding balances, that sort of thing. We also have information on inquiries that are made into the credit bureau uh, for applications for credit, as an example. And we have public record information, um, particularly on bankruptcies. We also maintain some additional information that you might think of as being part of a credit application, such as, such as excuse me, income and employment. We also like to talk about alternative credit data. So this goes by many terms. Um, in our industry, when we say alternative credit data, we really mean data that is not on that core credit database that I talked about a minute ago. So types of alternative credit data that aren't reported to the core credit database today can include rental payments, asset ownership, alternative financing such as payday loans, um, short-term loans, rent-to-own type loans. Um, there's additional public record information out there that's not on the core credit database. And most recently, we've incorporated consumer permission data. Both alternative data and traditional credit data have been found to be very predictive of a consumer's credit worthiness. And particularly, the alternative data comes into play in those cases of thin file and no-hit um, type consumers that I mentioned a minute ago. The Fair Credit Reporting Act regulates the collection, dissemination, and use of consumer credit information. And so all data used in credit scores are what we would call FCRA compliant. What does that mean? Um, that need, means the data needs to be accurate, so the credit reporting agencies must do their best to ensure their data is accurate. 
um, the data is disclosable, so consumers can see that information. Consumers can get one free credit report every 12 months, um, and they can see their credit information if they're denied credit, as an example. Um, the data furnishers also play a role in the process. Um, they have to confirm information when disputes <coughs> happen, and they're held to certain turnaround times as well as part of the dispute process. And lastly, lastly um, we were set up pretty nice earlier um, around fairness. Fairness is um, another part of the FCRA, so scores are, um, they cannot discriminate based on these different ECOA factors such as gender, marital status, race, and religion. So for about 30 years, we've been using scores kind of in their current form, um, which means they're using this core credit information that I talked about earlier. And so between that and our experience over time, we've come up with things that are generally acceptable in our space. Um, data that complies with those FCRA rules that I mentioned earlier, um, proven payment information, um, rental data, account uh, transactions from your demand deposit accounts are generally deemed acceptable. Um, generally not acceptable are things like social media data, you know, who your Facebook friends are, <laughs> um, sort of things, um, and any data that could discriminate um, in decisions, uh, or that could be discriminatory, I should say. Under consideration right now, we're looking at education level. Again, something to help us in that um, new to credit space. Think of students graduating from universities and, and having that information available so that they can more easily get credit and join the, the credit ecosystem. So one of the things about our industry is not only is the data itself, which we just went through, regulated, but the scores um, or the models are regulated as well. Um, there's regulatory guidelines around accuracy and fairness that have put, been put out um, by the OCC. Um, those, docu those documents or those guidelines, I should say, are um, pretty extensive. They cover the model development process, they cover model use, they cover model monitoring, when to redevelop, um, and they create quite an extensive amount of documentation. And in order to meet these model governance guidelines, many of our clients, so think of you know, big banks, big lenders, have had to create entire staffs just to take on this model governance um, requirements. We talked about the controls around discrimination, which lead to the need for transparency, and then in the FCRA, we were also required to provide your top four reasons for your score being what it is um, as well. And so the need for transparency or, or, or what we call explainability in scores is very high. Some key considerations when developing credit scores um, to meet all these needs. Um, I won't go through all these in particular, but they really cover the full um, life cycle. Um, we talked about um, at one of the earlier sessions, generalization. So our models need to essentially replicate. They can't just work really well on the training sample. They have to work well in production. If you think about credit scores in use today, um, think about mortgage in particular, the credit scores being used there are about 20 years old. Right? So these models need to continue to replicate and still um, rank order consumers in terms of their credit worthiness. Um, today, um, models have an average shelf life of about three years. So um, we're looking at AI to help um, us get models to market faster. Some research that we did, we tested several different techniques um, around machine learning. I, I won't go into each of them. You can see that here. but. Suffice it to say, the um, gradient boosted models are the ones for credit scoring and, and credit risk in particular that seem to be rising to the top. Um, when we let the machine run by itself, these are the type of results we get. Um, we see anywhere between a 5% to 10% lift, um, depending on the situation. This is a more generic sample for auto and bank card, so we see about a 5% lift if you were to do the math here. But our clients report anywhere up to a 15% lift as they start to really look at specific portfolios or specific lenders. This, however, is um, when you just let the machine run itself and you don't take into consideration that some of those things we talked about earlier. We do something that we call model refinement. And this is where um, 
you have to go in and ensure that your model is working as expected, that you can explain what's happening. You want to make sure that a credit score doesn't go down if a consumer has made some impact to their credit, such as paying off um, some of their debt or lowering their utilization. And if you don't do this refinement and you don't understand what's happening under the covers, um, that can happen. So when you go in and you refine the model um, through the requirements that we talked about before, you'll see that the lift in performance from the, um, in this case, uh, extreme gradient boosting methodology is lessened. So in our particular example, the lift went from 5% to 2%. Um, in other examples, we've seen that 15% or 10% lift come down to 5 to 8%, right? So on average, we're seeing about a 5% lift in accuracy from applying some of these techniques um, outside of our traditional regression methods. Um, this is just another example of addressing um, overfitting, which tends to be uh, a problem with some of these new methodologies that aren't, um, haven't been used in practice as long. Um, what you tend to do if you throw all the data into the machine and let it do its work, we have over 2,000 attributes, variables, characteristics that we will throw into a model, and it will use almost <laughs> all of them if it can, right? Um, and that tends to overfit and the model doesn't generalize. And so you do have to go in and manually intervene and not let the machine do all the work. Some of the advantages for uh, AI and credit scoring go beyond just the modeling. Um, you know, I mentioned a 5% improvement and I'm sure you guys are all sitting there going, ooh, 5%, 5%, <laughs> right? But in um, the credit risk world and credit worthiness world, we have very predictive models today. And so a 5% improvement is actually a big improvement. Um, the data that we use in the models is very accurate and, and so we get very good models. So 5% improvement is significant, but we're looking to use um, machine learning and AI methodologies across the model development lifecycle and not just in the model development itself. Probably most importantly to take away from today is um, in credit scoring, credit scores are static models. So most of us when we think of AI think of real-time updating, self-learning um, type models. Those are not in use in our industry today. These are static models. So while we're looking at these additional techniques outside of regression, um, we're still talking about static models. I mentioned the turnaround time or the shelf life of a model is about three years right now. With these new techniques, that's gonna come down, but we have to have the ability to go back in time and replicate our models. So lastly, um, there's some future policy regarding credit scoring that we wanted to make sure you were aware of. Um, today, unlike and, and, and what people think, um, your telephone bill and your utility payments are not reported to the credit bureau. Um, those are very powerful predictors, just like other payment methods, of future payment behavior and so of credit worthiness. And there's been several studies that show that today. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity and hopefully this gave you a quick glimpse into the status of AI and how, how it's being applied in credit scoring. Thank you. And thank you, Anne, for uh, that uh, very interesting presentation on credit scoring and bringing in the related legal and policy issues. Um, so uh, next, um, Melissa McSherry will begin her presentation. Uh, thank you very much and, and thank you so much for having me today. Um, I work with Visa. Um, uh, Visa is the world's largest uh, payment network and, and what that means is basically uh, when you use a Visa card, um, you're, the merchant where you use the Visa card basically calls their bank and says, um, can I authorize this transaction? And then Visa connects the merchant's bank with your bank um, who says yes or no, that's a good transaction uh, to, to authorize. And then that signal goes back to the merchant and all of that happens. Um, if everything goes according to plan, all of that happens almost instantaneously. Um, in that, um, uh, in that uh, context, uh, Visa is uh, very, uh, we work very, very hard uh, to make sure that the transactions that are going through are legitimate transactions, are not fraudulent transactions. I think fraud worldwide today is something like $600 billion, so it's a lot of money. Um, and, uh, and we wanna make sure that um, we, uh, do as much as we can to help banks prevent any of those uh, fraudulent transactions from going through while still making sure that 
um, all of the good transactions go through. Basically, when you, when you are actually the one using your card, if you try to use it, uh, that it actually works. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is one way in which Visa is using AI, specifically computer vision, um, to help us do that work of, um, of uh, looking after and preventing fraud on the Visa system. So you might be asking, what do puppy dogs and blueberry muffins have to do with preventing fraud? <laughs> And, um, and I put this up just to, to sort of illustrate uh, both the challenges and the opportunity in computer vision. So um, e all of you could look at these pictures and very easily discern what's a blueberry muffin and what's a puppy dog. Um, but uh, using the techniques that were available up until, you know, call it 2012, 2013, this is actually a pretty hard problem for most computers to solve. They would get it right about 75% of the time. Um, and uh, in, I think it was in 2013, uh, there's a competition uh, that, uh, that is run every year, and um, new techniques, uh, specifically things uh, called convolutional neural networks, started uh, coming into play and started dramatically improving the ability of computers to correctly <coughs> differentiate the muffin from the dog. Um, and so we're now at the point where um, these techniques can, can generally differentiate, muff not just muffins and dogs, but can differentiate different images um, about 97% of the time as opposed to 75% of the time, which is really quite good. Um, if you think about human beings, although if you're sitting there concentrating, you, you, know, you, you would always be accurate since most people don't concentrate all the time and they do sometimes make careless errors, human beings run at about 95% of the time, right? So when, when you give them a lot of images. So this ability to, to look at a picture and sort of say this picture looks like this one and this other picture looks like this other one, um, this is one of the applications of AI that has dramatically improved. And, um, and so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we use that application, that computer vision application of AI um, in the context of fraud. So. Um, just a couple of terms before we get started with this particular example. Um, first of all, what is a fraud score? Like, like I said, whenever you use uh, a card, um, Visa basically attaches a score to the transaction that goes to your bank that says how likely is it that we think that this is actually you using your card versus uh, someone who's trying to commit fraud using your card. We provide that information to the bank so the bank can make a decision about whether or not they wanna authorize the transaction. Um, and as you can imagine, we, tr we process a lot of transactions, right? So um, uh, that, that first thing we do on every transaction is we attach a score from zero to 99. Um, but then if we look across all of the transactions, we can actually say, for instance, all of the transactions in an hour, how many of them were at like the highest score, got a score of 99? How many of them were at the lowest score, got a score of zero? And it's helpful to us to look at the percentage of scores that are each in each of those bands. And the reason why is um, if you, uh, if we're running along and 1% of the population is getting the highest score, that 99, and it's nice and steady, and then all of a sudden like 10% of the population is getting a 99, that means that probably one of two things is happening. Either there's a giant fraud attack and there are fraudsters that are trying to um, in a very coordinated way steal a lot of money. And this does happen sometimes, right? Um, in which case we need to intervene. Um, and we typically intervene by uh, uh, calling the banks that this, that this is happening to. Or um, there's something wrong with our models or our system or how we're processing things. And again, that's a situation in which we need to intervene and we need to make sure that um, everything is actually working as we expect. So not only do we look at the fraud scores, we also look at the distribution of those scores. Um, and uh, so on the next page, this is just, this is a made up example, but I think it sort of illustrates what's going on. So you can imagine that this is a graph looking at the um, percentage of transactions in a particular score band. Um, and in this particular case, I just did it over days. And it goes up and down. And it goes up and down because for instance, the kinds of, the mix of transactions that you see on like a Friday night can be pretty different than the mix of transactions you see on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Um, and so the, um, <clears throat> the mix of transactions in a particular score band can go up and down. Now, if you look at this, it's pretty easy, again, like the puppy dogs and the muffins, it's pretty easy to see that at the end, there's something that looks a little bit different, right? That doesn't, that pattern doesn't look like all of the other patterns that came before it. Um, and this is, again, pretty easy for everyone in the audience to see that that's different. 
but it's actually kind of hard for the tools that we had prior to those computer vision tools to pick this up. Like you can't, like a traditional control chart, it's hard to write a rule that will get this because the, the, um, the actual numbers are sort of, they're inside the range of the historical range. They're going up, they're going down. They're not, it's just, it's hard to write the rules. But it's again, it's easy to see it um, using computer vision tools. And so what the computer vision tools let us do is basically um, do what a person would do in terms of looking at this and seeing a pattern that's different. Um, but the computer vision tools let us do that every hour of every day. I mean, the computer doesn't get tired. And people do. Like, they need to go do something else other than look at charts all day. Um, it lets us look at hundreds of metrics, not just one, right? And um, if you think about this, this is, a, this is a pretty simple chart that I put up here, right? This is basically one-dimensional, right? We sort of look at the scores versus one dimension. And so it's easy to see the, it's easy to see the variation. Um, if I had put a chart up here that had multiple dimensions, like we were varying a couple things at the same time, that very quickly gets really hard even for people to see the differences. But again, the computer vision techniques that, um, that we've been talking about uh, can pick those, uh, pick those variations up um, pretty quickly. Um, and can identify those. So we can not only monitor what's going on versus one dimension, we can monitor what's going on versus um, multiple dimensions. And it makes our monitoring that much better and that much faster. So um, just a quick explanation of how we've applied this in our particular situation. Basically, um, we built a model that looks at um, the distribution of each of those score bands that we just talked about. Um, so, you know, for instance, scores of 10 to 19, right? So it does this for each score band. And it looks at that, those distributions for a five hour period um, over each of the last 120 days, right? So this is, a, this is lots of data that's coming in. It's based, think, of it, think of the computer as looking at a chart, um, an hourly chart over the last 120 days. And from that, it forms an expectation of what the current five hour period is gonna be, right? Does it, is the, is the score, is the uh, distribution gonna be going up and then down? Is it gonna be going down, you know, down and then up? Is it gonna be going, you know, one direction or the other? But it forms an expectation. And then, um, and this is the part that relates back to the puppy dogs and the muffins, <laughs> it looks at the actual picture and it compares it to its expectation that um, it created based on the last 120 days, right? And so on the top row, we see on the right is sort of what we would expect right, for this time period uh, from the data that's come in over the last 120 days. And what we see on the left is what actually came in. And those two pictures, the computer would say, yep, those two things, they look similar. They're both blueberry muffins or they're both puppy dogs, right? But on the lower band, what we see is the expectation for the particular time period that we're looking at is just that the, the scores will be going up during that time period. But what we actually see is that they're going up and then coming back down. And the computer at that point says, no, 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 these do not look like they're the same. This is not, something's, something's not matching here. And that then uh, causes the, the system to generate an alert and say, hey, a, a person, a human being needs to go look at this, right? It might be that it's fine. It might be that it's just, I don't know, Black Friday, right? And so all kinds of things are different. Or it might be that there's an actual problem and we need to get engaged and figure out what the problem is and we need to figure that out promptly. So in this particular case, um, what's going on is the computer is basically taking a lot of work that might have been kind of boring and tedious for the people and doing the boring and tedious part and then just pulling out the things that are interesting and require human intervention so that the human can then go and figure out um, what we actually need to do differently. Um, one other thing I just want to call out about this particular example is, um, you know, I, so, so Visa is using a lot of different AI techniques across a lot of different uh, places in, in our system. These particular techniques are probably a, a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more further along and more uh, developed um, than, than some of the, the most cutting edge techniques, but they're still, you know, they're still on the front end of being applied in sort of real production environments. And one of the reasons that we started with something like a monitoring example, right, where we're, we're trying to monitor our own performance as opposed to exposing this to consumers um, was sometimes when, when we implement new techniques in a production environment sort of outside of a, a, of a laboratory, um, things don't work exactly the way you expected them to. And, um, and so we wanted to, in this particular case, uh, get a, a fair amount of experience 
working with this, um, some of these cutting edge uh, techniques, in an environment that was, um, uh, that where if they didn't work exactly the way we expected them to, you know, the impact would just be on us. Like we, we would identify a bunch of things we needed to look at that maybe we didn't need to look at, um, as opposed to the impact would be on consumers. And so, you know, as we talk about uh, these techniques, I think there is enormous promise. You know, I consistently find that uh, models used, uh, models built using many of these techniques consistently outperform uh, other types of models. Um, but I think it's also important that we um, develop the practical skills in how do we apply them, how do we understand them, how do we interpret them, uh, how do we make sure that they're doing exactly what we think they're doing. Um, as we as we go forward. So with that, thank you guys very much. I really appreciate it. And thank you for that very interesting presentation on how we said it's monitoring for uh, fraud. Um, okay, and next uh, we're going to go into some medical uses of artificial intelligence and we'll begin with um, Dr. Michael Abramoff uh, who will look at recent developments in that area. Deeper. Oops. Never mind. Your time's up already. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Why is it doing this? Excuse me. Anyway, thanks so much for inviting me here, having me over. Um, I'm both, uh, I have a long history in, uh, in uh, computer science and AI, and it seems that some others also mentioned that they had been doing this for a while, and you can sort of see my age from the fact that my master's thesis in 1989 was on neural networks to simulate the brain. And so I've been working on this for a while. I'm also uh, a professor of engineering and, uh, and also of ophthalmology and I'm a practicing clinician, as well as the founder and CEO of IDX, which is the company that had the first autonomous AI approved by the FDA recently. So it's actually being used on patients. And so I want to talk a little bit about the background of why AI in healthcare and specifically in diabetes and specifically in diabetic retinopathy this is the most important cause of blindness, the most important complication for people with diabetes. That's what they most fear, more than death or amputation, they fear blindness. And so we know very well what to do about diabetic retinopathy, this complication. I mean, when I see my patients, I know how to treat them, how to operate them, how to manage them. The problem is primarily that we don't find these patients. And so the so-called diabetic eye exam is being performed in maybe 20 to 30% of cases because people don't have symptoms, and so we need to look at the retina, clinicians like me, and it doesn't happen. It's mostly because it's really hard to get an appointment with me, which is necessary for this to happen. So the idea is, hey, let's use AI and imaging to, to make this better. So this is how it works. I'm not showing a demo, even though it would be only a minute or two, because this is not the appropriate context for that. But it's an autonomous diagnostic AI system. This means it gets a point of care result in minutes, but more importantly, there's no human reviewer oversight. So no doctor ever looks at the clinical result. The clinical diagnosis is being made without a physician. It means that you can now shift specialty diagnostics like what I do as a, as a specialist in an academic hospital to primary care and retail clinics, which of course increases the ease for which patients can undergo this exam. And you can also do something about cost of healthcare. Thank you. Um, it requires, however, a robotic camera because you want to make sure you can do this exam on the vast majority of patients, not just a few. It needs assistive AI for the operator, we will not go into that. And what, what it requires is a high school graduation for, uh, for that operator. And it's very important that you need clinical proof that it's safe for patients, right? And we'll go into that in more detail. And so, like I said, I've been doing this for a while, and you know, early on I said, hey, here's an algorithm, 2000. It can do it, let's just bring this into practice. And that's, of course, not how it works. You need to do a lot of science, and then you also need to convince the FDA that this is safe, as well as patients and physicians. And I don't show it on the slide, but my nickname is actually the Retinator, like the Terminator, <laughs> because in 2010, my colleagues were thinking, hey, he's like a Terminator, he will destroy jobs, and he's also not being safe for patients. And now they think very differently, but it can show you how this fear of AI you know, is, is, is not new, and it's there, and it's real, and so we also need to manage that. But anyway, back to what happened is, you do science, and then for many years, you do more science and more science, you get NIH grants, thank you, and NSF grants, thank you, and many other grants, um, and then more study sections, but 
Eventually, you get to a point where, well, do we do this at open source? It wasn't going to work, so you need to go through the FDA, raise money to go through the FDA because it took us $22 million to do this, and then eventually you build a company to do all of that. And so one of the things that happened during that part was that traditionally we used certain features for, for essentially what we now call AI, and I like the wave of AI, so I'm calling it that, but we took a sort of different approach because given the experience in neuroscience, we try to mimic the brain of clinicians and say, well, clinicians do it this way, why don't we build a computer that does it the same way? And there's a number of advantages that we now realize but were sort of not even thought about when we did it. And so we built detectors for each of the different lesions that you can see in the images of someone with, uh, with diabetic retinopathy. And on the right, I show this sort of process where the orange images are retinal images and then you can detect different diseases. It's like the puppy images and the, and the cookie images that were just shown, we build detectors for the eyes and for the raisins and other as aspects of that. And by now it's being used in clinic, actually patients are being diagnosed by the system with again no physician's oversight. So there was a scientific stage, I already talked about that, and we learned a lot from that, like the insights from neuroscience and evolution of mammalian vision. Sorry, I cannot read the slides over there, so I have to do it from the from the big screen. There were insights from clinical evidence, and it's really important. You need to put your AI in a workflow, in the clinical workflow, the care pathway, and that means it needs to fit there, fit with the preferred practice, practice patterns, with the evidence about certain treatments that we already have. And also you need to start thinking about how you actually validate an AI when typically you compare it to humans, but we already know that humans, clinicians like me and my colleagues, have a sensitivity, meaning the ability to detect disease, all of about 40%, so it's pretty low. So we're not really very good at making the difference between subtle degrees of diabetic retinopathy of this disease. And so how do you compare an AI to imperfect clinicians, imperfect truth? That was a big challenge that we needed to solve. And they have insights from implementation and the importance of image quality, which is easy to reach in a laboratory setting, but very hard to reach in a retail clinic like Walgreens or CVS, where there's no one with any retinal imaging training. Anyway, I already talked about this approach to essentially basing it on how the, the, the visual cortex, the brain of clinicians solve this problem, and we started to implement that. And that has now a, a sort of number of advantages that we hadn't realized at the time, but are now pretty logical. Um, did I go back there? And so, um, but before we, I explain it this way, I want to say that we already did a clinical trial in 2014 where we showed that we did better than clinicians. And we thought, well, that's important. We do better than clinicians, this should be enough. And the FDA and we, and I agree with them now, they rejected this clinical trial, said, well, this is not good enough. You need to show it in the actual environment where you want to use it. So what we did for this clinical trial was used in academic ophthalmology clinics where there's experienced photographers, the patient uh, selection is a little bit different, and we showed this result. They said you need to show it in primary care, but the people will already work there, the staff that's already there, which is typically high school graduates, and no former training in any, any type of retina or retinal imaging. You need to also decide on the truth, and clinicians are simply not good enough, so how do you compare it, what do you compare it to, and the answer to that was reading centers where it's very standardized for over 40 years. And you need to do it, like I already said, with the patients that are already there in those primary care and retail settings, not with a more selected subset of patients. So that was a clear lesson. And so these are the lessons we, and also the FDA, I think, learned from this uh, authorization that we got uh, in April of this year. A lot of things, system validation, all sorts of rules about that. You need the highest level truth so you can compare clinicians and uh, the AI, and also say that the AI meets certain standards in terms of safety and efficacy. And also, I already talked about the system as a whole. You do not evaluate it just as an AI reading images. It's actually a system with a robotic camera, with the operator, with the patients that are already in primary care. And then you need a pre-registered trial, meaning you, you state what you're going to analyze, what your hypothesis is, and you try to prove or disprove that hypothesis about safety, efficacy, and what the FDA and we thought was really important, that the vast majority of patients need to be able to undergo a diagnostic result. It's relatively easy to make an AI that does really well on a subset of about 10% of patients, but that is not enough. You need to do it on the vast majority of patients. I will not talk about this slide. It's, uh, I, I put these slides together two weeks ago, and when I saw the other slides, I realized this is not really the subject of this meeting. This is more regulatory stuff. 
Um, but anyway, so it cleared the path for autonomous AI in general. So it took us a long, pa you know, a long, a long time to do this. But now, essentially, the rules are set for how you approve autonomous AI, making these autonomous decisions. And here are some of the implications already talked about it. Explainability is now really important. And there's a number of advantages that were already discussed, but we actually showed it in scientific studies, and others have, other groups have now confirmed that. A, you avoid racial and ethnic bias, because by doing a design this way, where you explain it's based on detectors, it's based on lesions that, are, that we already know about for 150 years, clinicians have been using. When I look at a patient, I look for hemorrhages, for example, and I don't care whether that patient is from Iceland or Kenya, it doesn't matter, is they have the hemorrhage, they have the disease, and the AI does that the same way. But you also avoid the, uh, the, the lack of robustness that leads to catastrophic failure. We talked about adversarial images earlier. Well, we look at it as very small perturbations in the image that are not visible to humans, that are not visible to an explainable AI, but that CNNs, typical use of CNNs, are very vulnerable to, and we show that they essentially have catastrophic failure in 90% or more of cases. I have two minutes left, right? Um, and like <coughs> I said already, pre-registered clinical trial is really important to prove the safety. It's essentially how we approve drugs as far as the trial is concerned. And then it needs to fit into the clinic. We already talked about that. Um, and so I will move to the, the, ne the next slide, which is, well, this, what, what are the implications for others following us? And I think it's very important. It took us a lot of time, but it doesn't mean that others have, will have the same problem. I think the rules are set now. On the right, you see some uh, implications of doing it the wrong way. I mean, bad blood, you probably saw the book, and that's not how we want to do improvements in healthcare and use technology in healthcare. And one of our competitors has said the following, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you harm some patients or harm some, something on the way to improving technology and using technology uh, in, in, for example, healthcare, and this was autonomous driving. This appeared in the New York a few weeks ago. So it's very, it's very cogent right now to do this in a right and safe way. So we need to agree on uh, definitions and nomenclature. Uh, uh, you know, technology used in a lab does not directly transfer to what we do in healthcare. And it's very important. Patient safety is, pro is, is very paramount. And if we don't do it right, it will be pushed back and we'll lose all the advantages that AI can, AI can have in healthcare for better quality, for better, uh, you know, lower costs, and, and uh, for better accessibility, meaning easier for patients to have it. So again, I think these are the, the lessons we learned, that the FDA learned, and I think it will be very important going forward that if we do autonomous AI, we follow these lessons. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning everyone. Very happy to be here um, and join you to discuss opportunities and considerations of the use of AI in health and healthcare. Um, and briefly discuss uh, some activities that uh, my office has engaged in as long as um, some of our sister agencies in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. A little bit of background before I get started. I work at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. That's a staff division within the Office of the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, our charge has been really to facilitate the implementation and adoption of electronic health record systems. Um, ONC was created by executive order under the Bush administration and statutorily authorized with the passage of the Recovery Act. There's a big section in the Recovery Act called the High Tech Act, which um, created a bunch of different things. Um, one of them you may have heard of, it created an incentive program for eligible hospitals and providers to adopt and meaningfully use electronic health record system. It also created a certification program which the office I work in runs to certify, to ensure that electronic health record system includes certain functionality. Um, so with that backdrop, um, um, the number of electronic health record systems across the U.S. has increased significantly with about 90 some odd percent adoption in hospitals and close to that in ambulatory practices. 
And in, 20, in 2016, in December 2016, the 21st Century Cures Act was passed, which sort of uh, shifted our direction a little bit to focus on now that we have these systems in place, how do we make them talk to each other? So our priorities since then have been to focus on interoper interoperability of electronic health record systems and health IT systems, facilitating the liquidity of health data to enable effective and efficient um, health care delivery, as well as reducing provider burden or improving usability of these systems so clinicians have an easier time using them in practice. So how do we get into AI? Um, um, today I'm going to talk specifically about a report that uh, we released in collaboration with the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and the Robert Wood Johnson, Johnson Foundation that was conducted by a group, an advisory group called Jason. And I'll walk you through the goals of the report and some of the recommendations that came from it. Um, Leading up to the study, as you may have heard earlier in this panel and earlier today, as there's been a lot of progress in AI broadly, um, with the increase in compute and uh, the increase in uh, large data sets that are high quality and well labeled, um, a lot of strides have been made in machine learning and artificial intelligence. So uh, with that, we saw also an increase in uh, clinical applications. And so um, one of them you may have heard about is in uh, dermatology. Um, and it looks like, and the most recent one, my slides are a little changed, uh, most recent one is an application developed by Google, um, really looking at whether an AI application can detect um, metastatic cancer um, from a cancer that has not spread. And they've been able to demonstrate this successfully. 99% um, of the time, this tool that they've developed has actually uh, detected um, uh, metastatic cancer and distinguished it from a slide that doesn't have cancer. It was also able to accurately pinpoint the location of both cancers and observe lesions that, frankly, a pathologist would just not be able to detect with the naked eye. Um, these tools really have the potential to improve care, but may require uh, adaptation for successful clinical use. And it is important um, for them to be deemed effective and be spread across uh, healthcare and different applications that um, the technical soundness of their algorithms be tested and demonstrated, that they perform at least as well as the current standard of their clinical care. Um, they need to be tested across a wide range of situations and really need to provide improvement, whether that be in patient outcomes, uh, practicality of use, or reduced costs. I was at the American Medical Informatics Association annual symposium last week where Jess Mega from Verily uh, Life Sciences uh, gave the opening uh, keynote remarks, and she talked specifically about the need for rigorous testing um, and appropriate development and application of AI tools for them to be successful and broadly adopted and used in health and healthcare. Um, before I go over the goals of the report, I wanted to briefly mention that this is not our first um, a collaboration with Jason. So the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and Robert Johnson have previously collaborated on two studies with this group. Jason is an independent group of scientists who, uh, that have been advising the executive branch of the federal government for many years. And um, we specifically engaged them in a study uh, entitled A Robust Health Data Infrastructure, which helped inform some of our office's direction in terms of interoperability a few years ago. Um, we also engaged them in a separate study called Data for Individual Health, which looked at how um, EHRs and health IT could support individual health while allowing individuals to have access to their own health data. And this has actually, the recommendations from this report have helped spur the health app ecosystem we currently have. Um, a notable example for ex is um, Apple's use of ONC uh, recognized standards to implement their health app, which has now able, enables individuals to download um, health data to their iPhones from a whole host of healthcare provider systems. This third collaboration um, is the focus of this presentation and began a little over a year ago when we asked Jason to consider how AI could help uh, shape the future of public health, community health, and healthcare delivery. Um, the report focuses on the technical capabilities, limitations, and applications that can be realized in the next 10 years. We asked Jason to, considering, uh, to consider the opportunities, um, considerations, and implementation issues around the use of AI in health and healthcare. 
So under opportunities, there were things, uh, questions that they asked or looked at were ways in which AI may advance um, the improvement of health and healthcare, evidence that currently exists regarding AI's relevance for health and healthcare, um, most high value areas, and what kinds of benefits can be defined and assessed. Um, in terms of considerations, there were three categories that we asked uh, Jason to look at. One was uh, technical considerations, the other one ethical and legal is issues, and the last one workforce issues, which are very important um, if we're actually going to see uh, increased development of these ap uh, applications and their um, implementation across healthcare. And in implementation, um, we really asked them to look at other fields and what lessons could be learned that would be relevant to the AI application, the development and implementation of AI in health and healthcare. So what did they find? Um, essentially, uh, Jason concluded that um, the time may be ripe for the use of AI in health for three uh, reasons that are noted on this slide, namely, there's frustration with the existing medical systems, the ubiquity of smart devices, and comfort with at-home services. Um, Jason outlines a series of findings and challenges and makes some recommendations about how to successfully apply AI in health and healthcare. Um, and I'll go over those quickly, and I have included the link to the report, so you can sort of peruse that at your leisure, and I'm happy to um, answer questions after um, the session today. So um, Jason found that overall AI is beginning to play a growing role in transformative change um, now underway both in health and healthcare, meaning in and outside of the clinical setting. So the first challenge they identified was regarding acceptance of AI applications. And so um, they really recommend uh, supporting work to prepare AI results for rigorous approval procedures, as well as creating testing and validation approaches under conditions that differ from those used for the training set. With regards to leveraging um, personal network devices, uh, JSN recommends uh, supporting development of AI applications that can enhance performance of new mobile uh, to monitoring devices and apps, developing the necessary data infrastructure to capture the data generated from smart devices to support AI applications, um, and requiring development of approaches to ensure privacy and transparency of data use, which is a little bit of what Dr. Kearns alluded to in his remarks earlier this morning. With regards to the uh, issues around uh, training data sets, they really recommend uh, the development of research, the development and access to research data um, of labeled and unlabeled health data um, to support development of AI applications. Um, they suggest that new models are needed to incent the sharing of health data and new paradigms of data ownership. Um, some of you may have heard of um, a movement called Open Science. Um, so there's really an interest in sharing research data sets, but then um, in healthcare more specifically, uh, there's privacy and security considerations attached to the data, so we need to rethink under what circumstances we can share data to enable both discovery as well as development of these applications and validation of these applications so they can be more broadly used. Um, they also made some recommendations regarding the uh, uh, collecting data that are relevant to health but are not systematically collected or integrated into clinical care. So one example is environmental exposure data. Um, but today, your health is uh, determined mostly by where you live and more so than your genome. So we really need to think about what kinds of data are important to health and healthcare and how we make use of those data and include them into machine learning and AI applications so we make the right kinds of predictions to support whether it be prevention, diagnosis, or treatment. They really emphasized uh, building on the successes of other domains. Um, through competitions, for example, um, as well as understanding the limitations of AI um, methods and how they can be applied. Um, they talked about um, guarding against proliferation of misinformation in this emerging field. As you can imagine, there's a lot of hype about AI generally and uh, specifically in health and health data. So wading through that um, and ensuring transparency as well as um, endorsing best practices by learned bodies. So since I'm short on time, 
Suffice to say, there's a lot of possibilities. There's emerging applications in health and healthcare, um, and they range from public health to clinical health, as well as um, prevention and treatment. Our role is really to work with other agencies to identify what those possibilities are. Our focus is on uh, making data interoperable to be able to support the development of AI, understanding the data infrastructure issues and what kinds of standards are needed to enable this vision. And before I close up, I did want to mention two efforts that I thought would be of interest to this audience. So Gina Tarasi um, heads um, uh, Health Science uh, Data Institute in the uh, Oak Ridge Na National Lab that has two big collaborations, one with the National Cancer Institute and another one with the, uh, with the, Veterans, uh, with the Veterans Health Administration that are really meant to leverage both uh, the compute power and the methodological background that folks at Department of Energy have with the data sources as well as the research questions and health questions that folks on the other end have to um, enable new solutions. That I'll stop. Uh, section now. Um, so we've had um, a lot of discussion of the use of AI in different situations, and but at this point, I'd like to put the question squarely on the table. Uh, under what circumstances uh, do our panelists think that it might be better to use artificial intelligence technologies, broadly speaking? Uh, rather than traditional algorithms and vice versa. And uh, in considering that, um, is the selection of the technology generally based on technical considerations or the purpose of the analysis? Or are there other uh, practical policy or ethical issues that might add to the decision, uh, some of which we've certainly heard about already today? So if anybody would like to uh, address that question, please, uh, turn your table tent on the side. The table tent? Oh, you mean like, you mean this? <laughs> yes, that. Thank you. Okay, I was sort of meaning that way, but. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> So, um, yeah. so uh, when we look at when we would use AI versus traditional um, software programming techniques, you know, for the, the easiest cases for us or anything that is, you know, you need pattern for, uh, as he mentioned, we're looking for pattern recognition. So, the, so the, the technical subject matter of what we are trying to do has to be something that we can, is repeatable and we can train for. So we have to be able to have data that can reveal the problem over and over again so we can train the AI on it. So that's the kind of problem that we can solve with AI. So that for us, it has to fit in that category. If it's a very intuitive decision or a one-off decision or something that's non, not, not going to be repeated, it's not a candidate for us um, to use AI for, and that's still a candidate for what we refer to as human assistance. So when we think about how to design our software programming, we're looking at what parts can we pull away that are the AI parts um, and what parts are the parts that are, are probably always going to be the um, left up to the individual to add their value? Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, I, there's uh, a, a lot of work and in, in interest in, in human in the loop systems. And so that's probably actually the, the major category of, of deployed applications where we're not. Uh, it, it, it's a, a person working uh, together with, with an AI system. Uh, I, I mentioned in, 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 in my talk examples where uh, people on their own, uh, they, they simply can't handle the combinatorics of the problem. So that, that's uh, a good opportunity for using an AI system uh, t together with a person. And I think a number of the, the people here have, have talked about these, these issues of um, uh, fairness and transparency. There's also there's also some some et, you know deep deep ethical issues. Uh, so uh, there has been work, uh, particularly actually in, in, in Japan, on um, 
uh, robotic friends for the elderly. And, and so these are not truly uh, artificial intelligence systems. They, they're, they're simulated animals or, or, or simulated uh, people uh, that people with uh, diminished capacity might actually uh, come to regard as friends and, and have an emotional bond to. And I, I think that's a, a could be an example of something we could do, but we just should not go down that path. Thank you. And uh, yeah, just to add to, oops, am I supposed to push that? Yes. Just to add to, um, you know, the explainability side is very, very important, but also um, the ability to actually implement. Um, if you think about a lot of the techniques that, that have been talked about in neural nets, you know, I'll just pick on because it was mentioned a few times. That's been around for a long time, and um, in our industry in particular, one of the reasons it hasn't, it never took off, is because the implementation was more difficult, and so the technology today is there. So when you're doing your research and your analysis, you always have to think about the application and whether or not it can actually be <coughs> used in, in in production. Um, you know, just to just to build on what some of the other speakers have said. Um, we are consistently finding when we look at AI techniques, and, and I'll compare that to what I might think of as more traditional techniques like logistic regression or, or gradient boosted trees. Um, but when we look at um, uh, AI techniques, we are consistently finding that those models are outperforming um, the more traditional techniques. Um, I think that the um, you know one of the key challenges is is making sure that you have enough data so that the the uh, the models are not overfit. Um, I think, I don't know that AI necessarily is inherently more likely to be overfit, but because people are less experienced using it, the, the human beings are more susceptible to overfitting their models. There are good rules of thumb for how to avoid overfit in something like logistic regression, and the rules of thumb are maybe not as well developed um, uh, with AI techniques. Um, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic, though, as more people start building these models, those rules of thumb will, will come as well. Um, so I think you know having enough data um, is uh, is one of the key considerations. And then, as Angela said, um, you, you need to have enough you know computing power, right? So the, these are computationally expensive models to build, and um, depending on how you structure them, they can be computationally expensive to run. And as long as you have enough computing power, that's that's not an issue. But but w one definitely does need to have enough power. Thank you. Yes. It's interesting. Oh, um, I think where, where you need the performance, uh, especially in autonomous AI, you need you know, techniques that work. And so for us, it's really the technique that works. And it seems to be that AI is now starting to be uh, essentially uh, whole vector-based uh, deep learning, uh, where you don't know what it's doing. I, I don't think that's what AI is. A these are deep learning or convolutional neural networks are a technique. Uh, there's many different uh, machine learning techniques that you can all use. And what you saw, what we do, is we combine convolutional neural networks as detectors. And there's sort of a hybrid rule-based system over that and another AI to combine it into an actual dichotomous output. So there's, a, there's, there's many different ways, but you still call the entire thing an AI. I think that's valid. And so for me, it's higher performance. Uh, the better you understand it, the better, but AI doesn't necessarily mean that you don't understand it. We showed that we have AI, that you can clearly understand exactly what it does. So, so quickly, to, to build on others' comments, I would say that in healthcare, it's not like there's a set um, uh, number of circumstances under which AI should be used, but there's certainly some parameters that should be kind of guiding principles that I alluded to during uh, uh, my remarks and that uh, Michael was just alluding to. Um, um, you really need to be able to demonstrate that this is as effective or more effective than standard clinical practice. And it really needs to lead to better outcomes, uh, right? So, um, and so if, if there's enough testing and transparency around whatever AI tool or application is being developed, so long as it's better than the current standard of care and it's been shown to improve something that really needs to be, and that's ripe for automation, um, I really see AI as a tool that can help augment clinical care. Clinicians are extremely busy. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of knowledge that they need to wade, wade through to provide effective care. So think about how AI can help them do that in an unobtrusive manner in a way that reduces a burden on them to be able to practice. Thank you. So the next question is how accurate are the algorithms and AI tools that we've heard about this morning. And uh, if there is a wide range of accuracy, 
Why is that so? And also, if uh, <clears throat> is the accuracy related to the nature of the tool, the question being asked, or the data being used? Do you want to speak? Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so look, I, I think that um, uh, there, again, in our experience, um, the AI, the models that we build with AI, when the competence of the practitioner and the data being made available is the same, and we generally don't suffer from a shortage of data, um, just given what we do. Um, in those cases, we generally find the AI models to be more accurate. Um, that, but those two sort of, when these two things are the same, the, the data involved and the competence of the practitioner, um, those, are, those are often not actually the same in the real world. And so I, I think that um, the algorithms themselves are, um, again, in my experience, very powerful and very effective. Um, and, and we, uh, but the models that come out the other side um, can have a wide range of accuracy because um, you may or may not have adequate data that's relevant to the problem being solved and you may or may not have a, a person who's building the model um, who um, is really effective at structuring that model uh, to get the best possible outcome. So, you know, when we, we think about the outputs of these models, there can be a wide range, but my experience has been that has much more to do with the data that's available and um, the, the, tech, the sort of technical competence of the person building the model than it does the actual algorithms, which again, when we do head-to-head -head tests, seem to pretty consistently produce outcomes that are better using the advanced AI techniques. Yeah, and just, just to add on to that, there's, um, it, you know, credit scoring's been done for many, many years, so it's a very well-established um, predictive use of analytics, and, and so the, the lift that you see isn't not probably as great as it is in something that's more greenfield that hasn't been done for as long as credit scoring has been. But when I mentioned earlier in our particular study, we saw a 5% lift on using some of the more newer techniques um, outside of regression. Um, what I didn't mention is if you add new data in, you'll also see another 5% lift in performance, right? So the data becomes very valuable um, regardless of the methodology being used. It's, it's probably the most challenging problem in, in medicine and in, in, in medical AI is that what do you compare it to? I and my colleagues differ in about 30% of cases. And so if you compare an AI to an individual clinician, when do you know the AI is right and when do you know uh, the clinician is wrong? That you, you will never say that. And so averaging clinicians will not work much better either. And so we look for ways of doing better uh, and you can see from our, from our actual trials that we had really good performance, 97% sensitivity catching disease uh, on a data set that was not the ultimate truth to be used in a clinical trial that the FDA you know, authorized us on, where we showed 87% sensitivity, same system. So accuracy can be perceived to be very different uh, depending on what you compare it to. And I think it's really, really important that you compare it to the best standard out there, which is usually better than an individual clinician or even group of clinicians. And, but that's a challenge that is not really resolved, I think. Okay, so I would like to ask uh, an audience question uh, at this point. I just want to say that we're not going to get to all of the audience questions, but we're not going to get to all of the moderator's questions either. Um, and we will uh, hang on to these uh, questions and keep them in the FTC record. Um, but I'll start with this one. Uh, what, if any, efforts do you make to improve your applications of AI after implementation? Do you test for anomalies? Uh, do any third parties review your implementations to provide oversight uh, as you identify problems? So, so I'll, oh, sorry. I'll make a general comment, not specific to AI, but like anything else, you have to keep evaluating and testing. So it's part of this continual life cycle, engineering life cycle, whatever you call it, in whatever field or discipline you're in. So you have to do that with AI, same as you would with any new tool. In healthcare in particular, after something is implemented, you need to make sure it's working as intended and not leading to unintended consequences, undue harm, slower processes, or less effectiveness in care. Yeah, the FDA required us to build a whole system for continuous efficacy monitoring, meaning we have to consistently monitor that it's up to what we did in the clinical trial. Yeah. 
yeah, I mean, just to pile onto that, I think it's basic good practice that you have to monitor a model. And that's not, again, that's not specific to the technique. Like, you need to do that with any model, whether it's logistic regression or gradient boosted tree or deep learning or CNN or, you know, LSTM or it, really any, any algorithm. Like, you, you, if you don't monitor the performance of the model, eventually it will degrade and you won't catch it and then you'll make mistakes. Yeah, pretty much the, the same thing I was going to say is uh, not only that, it's, it's also regulated um, for us to need to monitor the model and, and show performance. I think in, in addition to the regular engineering testing, I think for us the new part about AI is uh, understanding that we have to test for um, inherent bias in the data set. So that was not something that Adobe did traditionally in its software practices when we wrote an algorithm in Photoshop that was not something we had to think about. But now when we train data to sort out pictures and answer queries and understand content, we actually have an explicit second step of you know understanding and testing for implicit bias. So that's new to, new for because of it. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> So my question asks, what factors have facilitated development and advancement of these technologies? Have certain resources and policies facilitated their development? Um, yeah, I, I, look, I think that uh, there are a couple things out there that have been very helpful. Uh, uh, first, for us at least, um, the availability of open source um, algorithms and the availability of open source data sets um, has been super helpful. Um, I actually have a, a person on my team who's a veteran of 20 years of using traditional techniques and she built her first TensorFlow model a couple months ago, and I said, wow, that's great. And she said, yeah, um, you can find anything on the internet. <laughs> uh, because you know, she was able to find um, you know, basically everything she needed to go learn this new advanced technique, because uh, it's just all out there. And so I think the availability, the, the robust um, open source um, environment and the availability of open source tools um, has something has certainly been something that we have benefited from from greatly, and, and we're very supportive of. There was also a, a big advance in in hardware around 2007 that made these techniques uh, for deep learning that that date back to the 40s, and and then with with additional work done in the 80s, uh, suddenly uh, scale to real world problems. And this was the this, the discovery by a, a group of researchers that you could repurpose the graphics processing units of, of computers that had been developed for computer games and for um, computer graphics in movies. Uh, these were just the perfect things to, to, to use to run neural nets. And they gave a 10,000 uh, fold increase in, in, in speed. And you, you very r rarely get a, a five uh, order of magnitude uh, speed up. And when that happens, suddenly, ideas that could only handle um, you know, tiny problems, you know, perhaps you know, they could read a zip code, uh, uh, could you know, to scale tremendously. So there was that kind of uh, hardware breakthrough. Uh, more, more recently, companies, um, uh, Google, and, and including Google, Facebook, uh, Intel, and uh, ARM, are all coming out with, with further um, uh, hardware uh, advances that are that are tailored for running uh, deep learning systems, and and uh, nothing so far will um, give a ten thousand fold um, a speed up that's on the near term horizon. Per perhaps with some radical new ideas about analog circuits, we might see at some point in the next decade uh, uh, another discontinuity in the performance. Um, I just on the, on the legal side, what's been helpful, um, especially for our neural nets, which are trained on images and documents, is in the United States we have um, a fair use exception to the copyright law, and we we can use that to allow ourselves to and, and other companies like us to access publicly available works to train our machine learning. In contrast, in Europe, you know, they have a copyright directive which currently prohibits that, um, and it makes it much more difficult to get data to, and to train our neural networks from from Europe. And there, there's some momentum around changing that, but I do. I think it's valuable to point out that the legislative framework could also hinder um, or help um, development of ML and neural networks. Yeah, on, on the regulator, regulatory side, I want to do a shout out to the FDA because they have been extremely understanding and willing to help and make this happen. And now we have the first one approved, uh, authorized, very careful, uh, this year. So I, I think from the regular perspective, it's, it's great. 
I want to make another remark from the sort of science funding perspective. I've been funding for NSF and NIH. That was really important starting on. But more importantly, these algorithms existed from Fukushima in the 80s. I used them, deep learning, uh, you know, backpropagation. Uh, I think for us in, in healthcare, it's always grappling with uh, noisy, insufficient data. And sensors, sensor design and cameras, et cetera, that was really important because I think AI previously failed, in medicine at least, because the inputs were so noisy. It was usually clinicians hearing patients talk who then typed it in, and that's just not good enough to have a really good performance. So the, the problems we are now having with comparing to clinicians are stemming from the fact that we're so good, and that is because better sensor data is available now. Well, long story, but... Uh, yeah, to add to Michael's comment, in, in healthcare, we struggle with the data quality, data completeness, um, and missing data, and so that creates a unique set of considerations if these um, applications or tools are going to be developed using data that's in electronic health record systems. And there really is a need to better understand what it is we can design with poor data quality and how far we can stretch those models. Well, I really wish that we could continue the discussion, but we are running out of time now, so um, I would like to uh, ask everyone to uh, join me in thanking our wonderful panel here. <laughs> and we'll now have a uh, break until uh, lunch, uh, for lunch, and we'll be back. Thank you so much for